On today's show, we recently learned that UFO legislation introduced by the House was not being considered for introduction to this year's NDAA. However, there was actually a perfectly legitimate procedural reason for this, and we'll get into why this is just a minor setback as parallel efforts are underway in the Senate. Former DoD analyst and Hill contributor Merrick von Rennenkampf states that most of the whistleblowers who have been informing UAP legislation over the last several years are completely unknown to the public. Actor Russell Crowe becomes the latest in a line of celebrities openly discussing the UFO phenomena. Former Aero Director Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick says he's sick of the UFO topic and is done giving interviews. Good riddance. We'll take a look at what this and upcoming legislation could mean for the future of the Aero Office. In a recent interview on the Ironclad podcast, Stanford professor and Soul Foundation founder Dr. Gary Nolan dropped quite a few tantalizing pieces of information. For one, he says there is evidence that there are multiple non-human intelligence here, and they might not be getting along with each other, and that there are plans underway for privately led crash retrievals. And finally, there's been a recent uptick in mainstream coverage of the UFO topic, with an article on Bloomberg, NBC and Fox News running multiple segments covering the recent Department of Energy hearings, with an exclusive on the follow-up questions sent by Representative Anna Paulina Luna, as well as multiple interviews covering the Harvard lead or Harvard-led paper stating that aliens could be walking among us, as well as the possible discovery of Dyson spheres. And here we go. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. Greetings, beautiful people, fellow citizens of the planet Earth, and welcome to The Lucid Lens, where we dig deep past the headlines into the UFO topic, related phenomena, ongoing disclosure efforts, providing additional context from only the most reliable sources. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy the content, consider subscribing, like the video, share it, but most of all, share your thoughts, theories, and opinions in the comments below. All this helps grow the channel but more importantly, raises awareness of these topics to hopefully reach more and more of the public, many of which still have no idea any of this stuff is going on, which blows my mind. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, story number one, we're going <laughs> to bid uh, farewell to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who apparently is stepping away from any further interviews on the UFO topic, uh, and talk about what this could mean for the future of Arrow. As for Sean Kirkpatrick, we may never hear from him again. He is sick and tired of the UFO nonsense, telling me I am refraining from any further interviews on the topic. So that was from Stephen Greenstreet of uh, the New York Post. Um, I, I, I wouldn't advise looking at the rest of the video. It's garbage like much of the rest of his stuff but however you know he brought us this great news that uh kirkpatrick is finally leaving uh, you know the public as far as discussions with this topic and you know i think kirkpatrick's role um you know his part in the story has come to a conclusion and he will move on you know to his nice cushy position at uh battelle or, wh or whatever uh, government lab um he was hired at and, and hopefully fade away from public view. But, you know, there's always a chance that he'll become the next J. Allen Hynek and pull a reverse Uno on us and fully acknowledge the reality and start fighting for transparency. I mean, who knows? I, regardless of, you know, his previous position, he was a senior research scientist at SAIC. He, he wasn't necessarily the ones making the decisions of what, you know, that office was doing, you know, whether he took the position knowing full well he would eventually be the fall guy or, you know, he was complacent in perpetuating the cover, you know, cover up and, you know, signed on knowing so. Arrow was initially created to put an end to the great work that the UAP task force was doing. Remember, that was originally spun up by Congress and the Pentagon said, oh, wait, hold my beer. We'll, we'll set up our own office. Don't worry. We got this, guys. And that was completely under, you know, the Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security reporting to Ronald Moultrie. A move that Lou Elizondo warned was not ideal, stating, please, please, please contact your representatives and let them know this is unacceptable and not in the best interest of the American people. 
The USDI is the one single office that has continuously lied about this topic and prosecuted whistleblowers. So this has been slowly in the process of being corrected by Congress through legislation after voicing much dissatisfaction in that arrangement. In the 2023 NDAA, where Arrow you know, will continue to use the OUSD INS for admin functions, however, now the security and operational oversight has been entrusted with the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, and the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. And uh, thanks to Reddit user Still Chill Trill for pointing me in the right direction, the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, is a strong ally of whistleblowers and in support of enhancing their protections. So these are the two folks that will be appointing the next permanent director of Arrow, not the OUSD and I, INS like before. Now, it still remains to be seen just how much power the director actually holds. We've not yet heard much from the interim director, Tim Phillips. However, Matt Ford from The Good Trouble Show was recently on another uh, great podcast uh, that I love, uh, really, with Tom and Dave, and I'll link that in the description below. It's you guys should check it out. They have so few uh, subscribers, it's, it's kind of sad. Um, but anyway, he recently mentioned that he's heard things from his sources in the Senate. Um, he's got a lot of great sources with you know Senate staff that Tim Phillips is basically going to toe the same line that Kirkpatrick did, which makes sense because they were both kind of brought in at the same time um, when Moultrie was running the show over there. So I think until Congress appoints a new director and, and they kind of gain full control of Arrow, it's going to be more of the same. So this upcoming hearing with Senator Gillibrand that we'll be holding again, like she did with Senate Armed Service before, we'll see how transparent they are, but I feel like it's going to be the same uh, type of presentation that Kirkpatrick gave the last time he was there. But, you know, Congress has been slowly addressing concerns with the Arrow office. The upcoming Intelligence Authorization Act will have the Government Accountability Office, the government's, you know, watchdog about to be set on them to make sure they're actually doing their job. UAP uh, special access program funding is being addressed. Uh, so it seems like all these holes are being plugged with the bad actors being outed and legislation being put in place to funnel everything UAP related through Arrow and hopefully transforming it back into the respectable office uh, to continue the great work that the UAP task force started. But at the end of the day, DNI and the Secretary of Defense are appointed by and report to the White House by the president. And if we don't have a White House that is willing to bring this topic to the forefront, it's doubtful we'll see any change in tune from Arrow, regardless of who the director is. Now, that could all change if this becomes a campaign issue, which we are starting to see lobbying groups pop up and efforts to raise the issue, you know, in upcoming presidential debates. However, from everything we've heard, you know, and former Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet uh, doubled down on this and has repeated this, that the White House doesn't want to touch this subject until after the election. But it does seem like all the pieces are falling in place slowly. I mean, the government moves slow, and I've, I've, I've heard that said, but after actually watching them, you know, address this issue, it's, it's been a long time for them to finally get, you know, Congress to finally get their grips on this, but... It's happening. I mean, it's slowly happening. So we'll see what happens uh, this year. I think who knows if a curveball is going to come uh, and accelerate things beyond, you know, the election is the big thing, right? They need to get past that, it seems, before they're going to fully address this. So we shall see. All right. Story number two. Uh, so Merrick von Rennenkampf, former DOD analyst and Hill contributor, dropped a tweet from a source he has in the Senate, and it stated this. Most whistleblowers who informed UAP legislation are completely unknown to the public. Individuals known publicly have been advocating for years and wouldn't have been enough to move the needle. Lots of questions about motivations once public. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. And this aligns with what Senator Chris Rubio mentioned, you know, last year before, you know, Grush even came out, that they have been having whistleblowers coming to them with the same stories of, you know, crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs. And, you know, I, and I get it in this age of, you know, social media where it seems like, you know, people do or say anything to, you know, accumulate the most clout. 
I, I mean, what a hollow existence that is. But I mean, that's the reality of the world we live in, right? Um, but for, for these people to risk their careers and humiliation uh, in a topic that was once so stigmatized, it, it you can't look at it like that. And I don't blame people for second guessing motivations for those in the public. But the fact that we have people who are, don't want any part of this public spotlight still coming forward, risking their careers, uh, coming to Senate Intel Armed Service uh, in the IG's um, and blowing the whistle is compelling. And that, and we've seen that with the amount of legislation that it has produced. So again, we, we, we kind of knew this was the case. You know, Grush brought his 40 some odd witnesses and we've heard that there's a lot more whistleblowers. And you gotta, you gotta think this number 40 that people have been repeating over and over again, that was how many years ago now, right? That Grush's investigation ended and he brought all these people forward and sent them through the IGs, the, the committees, and they spoke and, and gave testimony, which is why we've had like three or four years of, of legislation put forward. You got to think that other whistleblowers have been seeing this and, and we're starting to see them just come out on Twitter now. Like, and they're like, well, we're, we're, we didn't know there's a plan. We're just like, we're getting antsy. Like we're seeing this stuff moving. It's like, but it's not moving quick enough. So Folks are getting, I guess, a little trigger happy and kind of jumping the gun, which um, I know Jason Sands uh, recently said that, you know, Grush was kind of upset. And he's like, well, I didn't know you guys had a plan. Like, I don't know if there's really who, who knows. Right. But it sounds like there's probably a lot more whistleblowers in that 40 by now, because you have to think they're like, wow. I mean, like more and more people are probably feeling um, encouraged and um, emboldened to step forward. So. Yeah, it's great to see. Um, and again, like things are slowly moving forward. Um, so story number three, I'm sure most of you guys saw this already. You know, Russell Crowe is one of us, right? So you're probably asking, why am I talking about some celebrity? Who cares, right? Well, a lot of people care. I mean, back to the whole social media thing and how our society functions right now, you know, a large part of it, right? People are like attached to these figures and... Um, Celebrities hold a lot of influence over people, you know, for right or wrong, but their word carries far and wide. So when a bunch of them start talking about UFOs in a serious manner, you're going to get a lot more of the public to become interested and start looking into it for themselves, right? And we've seen this a lot recently um, over the past year. Kurt Russell coming out talking about the Phoenix Lights. Remember, he was a pilot um, that actually called in his sighting to the control tower. Uh, his wife, Goldie Hawn, recently opened up about her encounter with some entities. We've had uh, Aaron Rodgers talking, I believe, on um, either ESPN or one of the HBO programs um, about a sighting he had in the early 2000s with a couple other players. I think he saw like some some craft straight out of Independence Day is how he described it. And then two you know fighter jets following it quickly after that. Uh, and I believe the Oakland Raiders um, also recently were talking about a sighting they, they had on a plane. Uh, and then Donald Trump was just on a podcast talking about it. I mean, we're quickly getting to a point where everyone from ordinary folks to the most famous people in the world openly talking about UFO sightings and their experiences, which is what we all wanted, right? And when you have a population that is emboldened and, and feels comfortable talking about this subject, it becomes a lot easier to, you know, be loud and put public pressure on the government turning it into a campaign issue that will force our elected officials to take the matter even more seriously than they already are. I mean, we've heard time and time again, you know, from Ross Colhart and, and, and uh, Sharp and, and others and Ford that there's a very small vocal minority of Congress that maybe not the folks that we wished were talking most openly about this, but there are many, many more that are paying attention to this topic behind the scenes. And I feel like they're just kind of biding their time waiting for it to be a little bit more acceptable for everyone to talk about this. So, I mean, we could be quickly reaching a point where, you know, we get past the, the election or if it becomes a, a campaign topic, who knows? I mean, there's so many unknowns. I feel like anything could happen at this point where, all of a sudden, we got senators and Congress people standing up like, yeah, yeah, we need to fight for this. This is a big topic. And, you know, how it it's weighed against all the other, you know, large topics that, you know, are in discussions that are happening right now. Who knows? But, um, yeah, it, it, so it's interesting to see. But but it's great that more and more celebrities and, and, and just people who, you know, whose word 
carries weight and, and people pay attention to it. So, and, and hopefully that'll just make just, just more people come and come out and feel more comfortable talking about this. So let's take a quick look at what Russell says, because uh, I fucking love Russell Crowe. Did I say Kurt Russell? I don't know. I love them both. Let's go. What's your favorite conspiracy theory? Mm. Well, currently, I'm reading a lot of stuff that says, you know, full contact in 2027. And there's all these people that used to work for NASA or all these other organizations out there talking about how our history as a species is really simply a series of genetic experiments to get us to where we are now. When you look around, there's a lot of proof that <laughs> says that that might actually be a thing. Anyway, that's what I'm uh, thinking about these days. All right, so uh, story number four, NHI may be in conflict with each other and crash retrieval teams are being organized in the public. That's according to Dr. Gary Nolan from Stanford. And this comes to us from the Ironclad podcast who spoke with Nolan. There are operations being set up to make um, parallel retrieval teams that have nothing to do with the government to get there first. Okay. And hopefully not engage yourself in a firefight. But, you know, they, they have the means to get there first. Let's just put it that way. Why do they keep crashing so much? Um, <laughs> they so, have the ability to get here, but it seems like Earth really trips them up sometimes. Well, I mean, OK, well, m maybe the advanced technology is even in and of itself unstable. Let's say that we have means to bring them down. Um, there's evidence that whatever it is that we're dealing with does not all comport to a common um, command structure. It's not one thing. It seems to be many things. Hmm. Many things that might be in tension with each other. Now, I'm not saying that we're raw materials. Planet Earth is such and that we're being fought over by other things but that these things seem to be not happy with each other. At least there's evidence of that. Now, this isn't a new notion. We've heard the same thing reported many times. Um, last summer, Ryan Graves, I believe he was on News Nation, and he, had, he said this, he had this reported to him um, by pilots through Americans for Safe Aerospace, his organization. They were witnessing apparent dogfights in space above them while they're at what whatever elevation uh, forty thousand feet, and they're seeing up in space dogfights between UAPs. Um, and, and Liberation Times reported the same last year with their own sources. I mean, as the saying goes, "As above, so below." We still have conflict among ourselves. So if we're in fact dealing with you know various different NHI or even you know different you know the same NHI with having, you know, a con conflict of interest, that would still apply to an intelligence higher than ours. So, but my question is, what are they in conflict over? Ideologies? Us? The planet? You know, maybe there's an ancient defense network uh, that was left here and ultra terrestrials are defending the planet. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's sounding more and more like it's both fucking Star Trek and Star Wars. Like, what's incredible, though, is how discreet they are able to remain uh, with the sheer amount of activity. And the other thing that Nolan mentioned uh, was that there are retrieval teams being stood up in the public to get there first. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a little dangerous. Um, now, I can't recall exactly who, who it was that spoke about it, and I don't want to put out the wrong name, but we definitely heard before of multiple retrieval teams showing up at a crash site with firefights breaking out. Now, I mean, are these competing nations um, or potentially blue on blue? Like if, if, you know, our military detects something, but one of these black ops teams, that's, you know, a crash retrieval team gets there, but just a regular military, you know, outfit goes and checks it out. Are they, are they having firefights? I mean, what's, you know, so uh, we've only had just recently, you know, um, military wide alignment on detection and reporting of UAP. So who's to say, you know, one branch of the military detects something and goes to investigate and one of these teams shows up and that, you know, they go head to head. But I mean, now we're talking about private paramilitary groups being stood up in the public to beat them to the punch. I mean, sounds kind of dangerous, but I get it. At the same time, it's like, you know, Avi Loeb with the Galileo projects, like we're not waiting for the government. We're going to go collect our own data. I mean, there, there's a lot of groups standing up right now they're like well we'll, we'll 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 detect these crashes and we'll go retrieve 
the stuff ourselves. I mean, the cat's out of the bag. People are paying attention to this, even if a large part of the public still isn't aware. And I kind of feel like it's going to turn into the Wild West out there, you know, now that the cat is out of the bag and all these groups are going to getting stood up to go get this material themselves. I mean, could be a little dangerous, but I mean, hopefully the, I mean, the government's going to have to like stop this before it gets out of hand, I think. But I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, it sounds kind of crazy. Like, I can't imagine like just going out and, you know, trying to compete for these crashes. I mean, it's, it sounds like they don't happen too often. I feel like I've heard maybe one or two a year potentially, but you hear different things from different people. So you can't really uh, rely on that information. All right. Story number five. So we've got just a ton of increased media engagement over the last several weeks with the UFO topic. Uh, I mean, things have really picked up. We had that new study from Harvard when, uh, with Dr. Michael P. Masters saying that aliens may be walking among us with several different theories, such as, you know, crypto terrestrial, the temporal, temporal terrestrial, you know, the time travels uh, with Dr. Masters is famous for that. Um, and not only that, we've had multiple great segments on Fox and uh, NBC, News Nation about potential Dyson spheres that have been detected. There's been murmurings. I think Nick Pope also just touched on this, that the James Webb has detected bio or techno signatures. I mean, it's crazy how all of this seems to be coming to a head at the same time. Uh, so, But you might remember recently, we recently had that um, House Oversight hearing with the Department of Energy, where both Luna and Burchette tag-teamed with a series of UAP-related questions, which were mostly met with, um, you know, like, word-for-word reading of a script from the Pentagon's, you know, line of denials and UFOs, of aliens and UFOs. And I think Burchette said, you know, I'm talking about repeated UAP incursions, and she was like, oh, oh, yes, right. Um, oh, oh, the Pentagon said that there's no aliens on planet Earth. And he's just like, well, that's, that's not what I said, and this has been going on for longer than we've had drones, so uh, lady, like, get with the program. I mean, she was, like, squirming up on the stand trying to answer these questions, and, and Burchette laid into her at the end, revealing that they had to threaten her with a subpoena to get her to, to even come in. Uh, but Luna also added um, when she spoke that they would be sending additional questions to the DOE, and Fox News got the exclusive access to those questions, which are very well educated uh, and could be quite revealing depending on how they are answered. So let's read through these real quick. So Luna's questions are, uh, number one, how are unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, and unmanned aerial systems, UAS, designated by DOE? Number two is what characteristics would an object need to display to be considered a UAP? Now, this is this is a very uh, poignant question because the, if the Pentagon keeps calling these these incursions into Langley, which we've heard, heard a lot about, they keep considering them or calling them drone incursions or UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAS, unmanned aerial systems, which we know we know that isn't the case. And, and Matt Ford um, from Good Trouble Show again spoke recently about this. Um, we know they're they are actually UAPs. We have drone. Um, detection and anti-drone technology, which could take these down. We have no trouble taking down drones everywhere else in the world. But for some reason, when we have intrusions on our bases, we somehow can't deal with it and we're unable to take these things down. So it's quite telling to see how they uh, answer these questions to see how the DOE does designate between these various things. And we know what an UAP is, right? It, It displays the now six observables, which... We'll see how they answer, but I feel like if we get good answers, then us, the public, aren't going to hear about it. But Luna might share. We'll see. Uh, So number four here, at Formula One events, private companies are deployed, which can disable drones and trace the operator. Is that technology available to the DOE? And a follow-up, number five, if so, how many drones were you able to track to an operator and how many were you able to disable? Again, it's like, look, we can deal with drones. If these are not drones, well... Okay, why aren't we hearing about this, and why isn't Arrow, you know, being provided this information? Um, and that's another thing actually Ford brought up recently was Arrow is sitting on a ton of true UAP, but they only pass the garbage, um, prosaic stuff to Congress and to the public. Uh, number six: How many UAP incursions have been reported internally this year alone across all critical infrastructure locations with DOE oversight? 
uh, example, nuclear armament, refinement, and deployment sites like Pantex and the Savannah River site. And Pantex, they've had multiple incursions there. Uh, Jeremy Corbell and Weaponized recently spoke about this with George Knapp. Uh, and I believe they actually had somebody else on who, who did a, a FOIA request and discovered another separate incursion. Um, one was, I believe, a triangular or diamond-shaped with a dome top. And then... Um, one of them was the jellyfish, I think. So there's been multiple different types in, um, intruding on that site. Uh, several reports indicate frequent drone incursions over DOE nuclear facilities, including an incident on April 1st, 2021 at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Can you detail the DOE security or current security measures to prevent unauthorized drone activities? And what steps are being taken to enhance these measures, given the frequency of such incidents? Yeah, I mean... It's like, what, what is your plan to deal with all this stuff? How are you dealing with it all? I mean, it, it's, they, they were so uh, ambiguous with their, their question, with their answers in the actual hearing. So it's going to be interesting to see how they respond to this. Uh, the recent error report highlights that better data collection is crucial for understanding UAP phenomena. What technologies and methodologies are the DOE employing to gather and analyze data related to UAP sightings, particularly those near critical infrastructure? Uh, given the potential security and safety risk posed by UAPs near nuclear facilities, what protocols are in place to ensure the safety of DOE personnel in public? Have there been any documented cases of adverse health effects on personnel due to UAP encounters? In the spirit of transparency, how does the DOE handle the public disclosure of UAP incidents? Are there any plans to declassify and release more detailed reports on UAP sightings over DOE facilities to inform and reassure the public? Yeah, so they... um. These were very, very well informed, fantastic questions. I'm very much looking forward to see how far, you know, into a pretzel the DOE will have to twist to answer these. <laughs> I mean, they're gonna they're going right for the jugular. Um, and kudos to the House Oversight staff who most likely informed and wrote many of these. And we'll have to wait and see what how much can be revealed to the public. Um, but these were very uh, well thought out. Um, and we'll see what the DOE stance on, you know, how they declare what the difference is between all these various types of things they're saying, oh, they're all just drones, some drones that shouldn't be there. Well, okay, well, why are you letting them <laughs> go? Why are you letting them go there? I mean, and they admitted uh, in that DOE that they do work with JSOC, who we know has been one of the outfits the uh, CIA uses for these crash retrievals. So we know they're holding back a lot of information. I mean, that's that's kind of the whole uh, theme of this. So we'll have to see what uh, what answers they provide to Congress and if Congress is able to you know give us any juicy details on it. And now for our final story, uh, Robert Garcia's and much of the House's UAP legislation not being considered, but there's still hope. So many of you likely heard that the four pieces of legislation proposed by the House did not even make it to the floor for consideration. And this included the Safe Aerospace for Americans Act from Representatives Grothman, Garcia, and Moskowitz, the UAP Transparency Act by Burchette and Burleson, the increased, aware, uh, increased access for aero into Title 50 programs from Garcia, and the reintroduction of the UAPDA, co-sponsored by Garcia and Moskowitz. This was the reintroduction of the Schumer legislation, uh, Schumer Rounds 2.0, with everything that was kind of stripped. Now, I initially saw a lot of folks saying that, oh, Mike Turner and company strike again, and people were posting, oh, these are the members on the Rules Committee, and these are guys who blocked it. However, uh, Lester from UAP Caucus shed some light on what actually happened, and this is more of uh, this was actually more about politics than specific UAP pushback. Let's take a listen. The reason for the four UAP amendments not being brought for floor consideration yesterday is much more of a procedural issue than it is an active pushback issue, and we were made aware of this point in an email we received from a staffer for a member on the Rules Committee late Monday evening. And in that email, they mentioned that the member, quote, certainly is interested in UAP legislation. However, we have been provided with a narrow scope for the NDAA amendment consideration. So generally speaking, we are only considering amendments with a HASC or House Armed Services Committee referral. And it is our view that the members that had proposed those amendments did not have that Armed Services Committee referral in order for it to then ultimately get into the mix. So again, I just want to make the distinction here that not only was this a procedural issue more than active pushback as it relates to those specific amendments, um, it's also important to remember that 
we've only ever really seen two pieces of UAP related legislation make it out of the House. So Lester, you know, also stated that the ranking member of the Armed Service Committee, Adam Smith, put out a statement uh, that a referral from a House Armed Service Committee member was required for amendments to be considered. And their whole reasoning was, you know, they wanted to keep the scope narrow, bipartisan, you know, to prevent more radical members of the House from getting things um, pushed to a floor vote that are well outside the norm of the mainstream. And he, he used the example like defunding NATO and, you know, they don't want to derail the existing bipartisan bill. Like this bill, this has to pass every year, right? This funds the military. Um, so they don't want to derail that and, and potentially, you know, cause that to not pass and not have the military funded. Um, but as Lester mentioned, the Senate is responsible for the vast majority of the UFO-related, UAP-related legislation that's been proposed over the last several years. And Senator Rounds recently mentioned uh, to Matt Laszlo on Ask a Poll that Senate Intel has their version of the Schumer Rounds UAPDA 2.0 almost ready, and the Intelligence Authorization Act, which I went into in my last video, will include various provisions, including the Accountability Office to look into Aero vastly enhanced whistleblower protections, uh, defunding not reported or non-reported UAP programs. The only piece that the Senate uh, doesn't have an answer for is the Safe Aerospace for Americans Act, which was you know inspired by Ryan Graves and his organization. Um, however, they could potentially you know get the Senate to introduce something similar. It's basically just you know reporting structure um, for commercial pilots. Yeah, so so Congress is you know mostly um, pursuing this, like they they know a lot more than they're letting on to the public. But in order to get this stuff to pass, you know they they need to take the 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 security risk and the flight safety risk approach to get people to pay attention to this and pour resources into it. That's the way you're going to get folks on board. You, you can't jump to non-human intelligence, even though they, the gang of eight and, and, you know, some of these committees already know they're, they're well read in the vast majority of Congress isn't quite there, although they may suspect, but you have to get the support of everyone. Take the national security, the, the flight risk approach. Okay. Once we get past that, okay, now let's talk about what this stuff actually is. All right. And, and that's the way you got to do it. You got to slowly get walk people before, you know, you can't j jump past all these steps. So we'll see if the Senate introduces their own version of it. But I know Ryan Graves and his organization, they're not going to stop just because the House version failed. They're going to keep pushing. And hopefully if the Senate doesn't do it, then then maybe next year we'll get something for commercial pilots. Um, but, you know, soon we'll have the Senate's proposals um, for their version, you know, of the NDAA. And we'll enter conference committee just like last year where they will debate over what makes it into the final bill. Uh, the big question is, you know, what does the Senate's version of the UAPDA look like with regards to, you know, the review board and the eminent domain clause? I assume they've been negotiating and, and, and thinking through this, you know, over the last year, uh, and hopefully they've reached a consensus that both sides are happy with. We'll have to wait and see what the final language uh, even is. And then, you know, both sides of Congress will enter that debate. So yeah, hopefully we'll see the Senate's version soon and the uh, the countdown can begin again. I feel like last year was, um, you know, a big learning experience for them, both identifying, you know, the pain points and where the pushback was. And, and hopefully, you know, in the meantime, an, enough awareness has been raised um, in the subject in both Congress and the public at large. Um, I mean, a lot has, you know, happened between then and now where, you know, we've had just just more or less nonstop coverage over this stuff. So the people that, you know, can make some big moves and changes, they've definitely caught wind of this stuff. And especially with, you know, the salt and we've got um, the financial sector. I mean, the right people are in, are in the know right now. And hopefully, you know, enough attention has been brought to the subject that pressure can be applied where it's needed to get this passed this year. And then we can move forward one step forward at a time. Well, that's it for me today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and I'll see you on the flip side. Peace.